Story six of A Changed Man and Other Tales by Thomas Hardy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story six A Tryst at an Ancient Earthwork. At one's every step forward it rises higher against the south sky, with an obtrusive personality that compels the senses to regard it and consider. The eyes may bend in another direction, but never without the consciousness of its heavy, high-shouldered presence at its point of vantage. Across the intervening levels the gale races in a straight line from the fort, as if breathed out of it hitherward with the shifting of the clouds the faces of the steeps vary in colour and in shade broad lights appearing where mist and vagueness had prevailed dissolving in their turn into melancholy grey which spreads over and eclipses the luminous bluffs in this so thought immutable spectacle all is change out of the invisible marine region on the other side birds soar suddenly into the air and hang over the summits of the heights with the indifference of long familiarity their forms are white against the tawny concave of cloud and the curves they exhibit in their floating signify that they are seagulls which have journeyed inland from expected stress of weather as the birds rise behind the fort so do the clouds rise behind the birds almost as it seems stroking with their bagging bosoms the uppermost flyers the profile of the whole stupendous ruin as seen at a distance of a mile eastward is cleanly cut as that of a marble inlay it is varied with protuberances which from hereabouts have the animal aspect of warts winds knuckles and hips it may indeed be likened to an enormous many-limbed organism of an antediluvian time partaking of the cephalopod in shape lying lifeless and covered with a thin green cloth which hides its substance while revealing its contour this dull green mantle of herbage stretches down toward the levels where the ploughs have essayed for centuries to creep up near and yet nearer to the base of the castle but have always stopped short before reaching it the furrows of these environing attempts show themselves distinctly bending to the incline as they trench upon it mounting in steeper curves till the steepness baffles them and their parallel threads show like the striae of waves pausing on the curl the peculiar place of which these are some of the features is my dun the castle of the great hill said to be the dunium of ptolemy the capital of the durotrigas which eventually came into roman occupation and was finally deserted on their withdrawal from the island the evening is followed by a night in which an invisible moon bestows a subdued yet pervasive light without radiance as without blackness from the spot whereon i am ensconced in a cottage a mile away the fort has now ceased to be visible yet as by day to anybody whose thoughts have been engaged with it and its barbarous grandeurs of past time the form asserts its existence behind the night gauzes as persistently as if it had a voice moreover the south-west wind continues to feed the intervening arable flats with vapours brought directly from its sides the midnight hour for which there has been occasion to wait at length arrives and i journey towards a stronghold in obedience to a request urged earlier in the day it concerns an appointment which i rather regret my decision to keep now that night is come the route thither is hedgeless and treeless i need not add deserted the moonlight is sufficient to disclose the pale ribbon-like surface of the way as it trails along between the expanses of darker fallow though the road passes near the fortress it does not conduct directly to its fronts as the place is without an inhabitant so it is without a trackway so presently leaving the macadamized road to pursue its course elsewhither i step off upon the fallow and plod stumblingly across it the castle looms out of the shade by degrees like a thing waking up and asking what i want there 
it is now so enlarged by nearness that its whole shape cannot be taken in at one view the ploughed ground ends as the rise sharpens the sloping basement of grass begins and i climb upward to invade my dun impressive by day as this largest ancient british work in the kingdom undoubtedly is its impressiveness is increased now after standing still and spending a few minutes in adding its age to its size and its size to its solitude it becomes appallingly mournful in its growing closeness a squally wind blows in the face with an impact which proclaims that the vapours of the air sail low to-night the slope that i so laboriously clamber up the wind skips sportively down its track can be discerned even in this light by the undulations of the withered grass bents the only produce of this upland summit except moss four minutes of ascent and a vantage ground of some sort is gained it is only the crest of the outer rampart immediately within this a chasm gapes its bottom is imperceptible but the counterscarp slopes not too steeply to admit of a sliding descent if cautiously performed the shady bottom dank and chilly is thus gained and reveals itself as a kind of winding lane wide enough for a wagon to pass along floored with rank herbage and trending away right and left into obscurity between the concentric walls of earth the towering closeness of these on each hand their impenetrability and their ponderousness are felt as a physical pressure the way is now up the second of them which stands steeper and higher than the first to turn aside as did christian's companion from such a hill difficulty is the more natural tendency but the way to the interior is upward there is of course an entrance to the fortress but that lies far off on the other side it might possibly have been the wiser course to seek for easier ingress there however being here i ascend the second acclivity the grass stems the grey beard of the hill sway in a mass close to my stooping face the dead heads of these various grasses fescues foxtails and rise bob and twitch as if pulled by a string underground from a few thistles a whistling proceeds and even the moss speaks in its humble way under the stress of the blast that the summit of the second line of defence has been gained is suddenly made known by a contrasting wind from a new quarter coming over with the curve of a cascade these novel gusts raise a sound from the whole camp or castle playing upon it bodily as upon a harp it is with some difficulty that a foothold can be preserved under their sweep looking aloft for a moment i perceive that the sky is much more overcast than it has been hitherto and in a few instants a dead lull in what is now a gale ensues with almost preternatural abruptness i take advantage of this to sidle down the second counterscarp but by the time the ditch is reached the lull reveals itself to be but the precursor of a storm it begins with a heave of the whole atmosphere like the sigh of a weary strong man on turning to recommence unusual exertion just as i stand here in the second fosse that which now radiates from the sky upon the scene is not so much light as vaporous phosphorescence the wind quickening abandons the natural direction it has pursued on the open upland and takes the course of the gorge's length rushing along therein helter-skelter and carrying thick rain upon its back the rain is followed by hailstones which fly through the defile in battalions rolling hopping ricocheting snapping clattering down the shelving banks in an indefinable haze of confusion the earthen sides of the fosse seem to quiver under the drenching onset though it is practically no more to them than the blows of thor upon the giant of Juttenland it is impossible to proceed further till the storm somewhat abates and i draw up behind a spur of the inner scarp where possibly a barricade stood two thousand years ago and thus await events 
the roar of the storm can be heard travelling the complete circuit of the castle a measured mile coming round at intervals like a circumambulating column of infantry doubtless such a column has passed this way in its time but the only columns which enter in these latter days are the columns of sheep and oxen that are sometimes seen here now while the only semblance of heroic voices heard are the utterances of such and of the many winds which make their passage through the ravines the expected lightning radiates round and a rumbling as from its subterranean vaults if there are any fills the castle the lightning repeats itself and coming after the aforesaid thoughts of martial men it bears a fanciful resemblance to swords moving in combat it has the very brassy hue of the ancient weapons that here were used the so sudden entry upon the scene of this metallic flame is as the entry of a presiding exhibitor who unrolls the maps uncurtains the pictures unlocks the cabinets and effects a transformation by merely exposing the materials of his science unintelligibly cloaked till then the abrupt configuration of the bluffs and mounds is now for the first time clearly revealed mounds whereon doubtless spears and shields have frequently lain while their owners loosened their sandals and yawned and stretched their arms in the sun for the first time too a glimpse is obtainable of the true entrance used by its occupants of old some way ahead there where all passage has seemed to be inviolably barred by an almost vertical facade the ramparts are found to overlap each other like loosely clasped fingers between which a zigzag path may be followed a cunning construction that puzzles the uninformed eye but its cunning even where not obscured by dilapidation is now wasted on the solitary forms of a few wild badgers rabbits and hares men must have gone out by these gates in the morning to battle with the roman legions under vespasian some to return no more others to come back at evening bringing with them the noise of their heroic deeds but not a page not a stone has preserved their fame acoustic perceptions multiply to-night we can almost hear the stream of years that have borne these deeds away from us strange articulations seem to float on the air from that point the gateway where the animation in past times must frequently have concentrated itself at hours of coming and going and general excitement there arises an ineradicable fancy that they are human voices if so they must be the lingering airborne vibrations of conversations uttered at least fifteen hundred years ago the attention is attracted from mere nebulous imaginings about yonder spot by a real moving of something close at hand i recognize by the now moderate flashes of lightning which are sheet-like and nearly continuous that it is the gradual elevation of a small mound of earth at first no larger than a man's fist it reaches the dimensions of a hat then sinks a little and is still it is but the heaving of a mole who chooses such weather as this to work in from some instinct that there will be nobody abroad to molest him as the fine earth lifts and lifts and falls loosely aside fragments of burnt clay roll out of it clay that once formed part of cups or other vessels used by the inhabitants of the fortress the violence of the storm has been counterbalanced by its transitoriness from being immersed in well-nigh solid media of cloud and hail shot with lightning i find myself uncovered of the humid investiture and left bare to the mild gaze of the moon which sparkles now on every wet grass blade and frond of moss but i am not yet inside the fort and the delayed ascent of the third and last escarpment is now made it is steeper than either the first was a surface to walk up the second to stagger up the third can only be ascended on the hands and toes 
on the summit obtrudes the first evidence which has been met with in these precincts that the time is really the nineteenth century it is in the form of a white notice-board on a post and the wording can just be discerned by the rays of the setting moon caution any person found removing relics skeletons stones pottery tiles or other material from this earthwork or cutting up the ground will be prosecuted as the law directs here one observes a difference underfoot from what has gone before scraps of roman tile and stone chippings protrude through the grass in meagre quantity but sufficient to suggest that masonry stood on the spot before the eye stretches under the moonlight the interior of the fort so open and so large is it as to be practically an upland plateau and yet its area lies wholly within the walls of what may be designated as one building it is a long violated retreat all its cornerstones plinths and architraves were carried away to build neighbouring villages even before mediaeval or modern history began many a block which once may have helped to form a bastion here rests now in broken and diminished shape as part of the chimney corner of some shepherd's cottage within the distant horizon and the cornerstones of this heathen altar may form the base course of some adjoining village church yet the very bareness of these inner courts and wards their condition of mere pasturage protects what remains of them as no defences could do nothing is left visible that the hands can seize on or the weather overturn and a permanence of general outline at least results which no other condition could ensure the position of the castle on this isolated hill bespeaks deliberate and strategic choice exercised by some remote mind capable of prospective reasoning to a far extent the natural configuration of the surrounding country and its bearing upon such a stronghold were obviously long considered and viewed mentally before its extensive design was carried into execution who was the man who said let it be built here not on that hill yonder or on that ridge behind but on this best spot of all whether he were some great one of the belgae or of the duratriges or the travelling engineer of britain's united tribes must for ever remain time's secret his form cannot be realised nor his countenance nor the tongue that he spoke when he set down his foot with a thud and said let it be here within the innermost enclosure though it is so wide that at a superficial glance the beholder has only a sense of standing on a breezy down the solitude is rendered yet more solitary by the knowledge that between the benighted sojourner herein and all kindred humanity are those three concentric walls of earth which no being would think of scaling on such a night as this even were he to hear the most pathetic cries issuing hence that might be uttered by a spectre-chased soul i reach a central mound or platform the crown and axis of the whole structure the view from here by day must be of almost limitless extent on this raised floor dais or rostrum harps have probably twanged more or less tuneful notes in celebration of daring strength or cruelty of worship superstition love birth and death of simple loving-kindness perhaps never many a time must the king or leader have directed his keen eyes hence across the open lands towards the ancient road the icening way still visible in the distance on the watch for armed companies approaching either to succour or to attack i am startled by a voice pronouncing my name past and present have become so confusedly mingled under the associations of the spot that for a time it has escaped my memory that this mound was the place agreed on for the aforesaid appointment i turn and behold my friend he stands with a dark lantern in his hand and a spade and light pickaxe over his shoulder he expresses both delight and surprise that i have come i tell him i had set out before the bad weather began 
he to whom neither weather darkness nor difficulty seems to have any relation or significance so entirely is his soul wrapped up in his own deep intentions asks me to take the lantern and accompany him i take it and walk by his side he is a man about sixty small in figure with grey old-fashioned whiskers cut to the shape of a pair of crumb brushes he is entirely in black broadcloth or rather at present black and brown for he is bespattered with mud from his heels to the crown of his low hat he has no consciousness of this no sense of anything but his purpose his ardour for which causes his eyes to shine like those of a lynx and gives his motions all the elasticity of an athlete's nobody to interrupt us at this time of night he chuckles with fierce enjoyment we retreat a little way and find a sort of angle an elevation in the sod a suggested squareness amid the mass of irregularities around here he tells me if anywhere the king's house stood three months of measurement and calculation have confirmed him in this conclusion he requests me now to open the lantern which i do and the light streams out upon the wet sod at last divining his proceedings i say that i had no idea in keeping the tryst that he was going to do more at such an unusual time than meet me for a meditative ramble through the stronghold i ask him why having a practicable object he should have minded interruptions and not have chosen the day he informs me quietly pointing to his spade that it was because his purpose is to dig then signifying with a grim nod the gaunt notice-post against the sky beyond i inquire why as a professed and well-known antiquary with capital letters at the tail of his name he did not obtain the necessary authority considering the stringent penalties for this sort of thing and he chuckles fiercely again with suppressed delight and says because they wouldn't have given it he at once begins cutting up the sod and as he takes the pickaxe to follow on with assures me that penalty or no penalty honest men or marauders he is sure of one thing that we shall not be disturbed at our work till after dawn i remember to have heard of men who in their enthusiasm for some special science art or hobby have quite lost the moral sense which would restrain them from indulging it illegitimately and i conjecture that here at last is an instance of such an one he probably guesses the way my thoughts travel for he stands up and solemnly asserts that he has a distinctly justifiable intention in this matter namely to uncover to search to verify a theory or displace it and to cover up again he means to take away nothing not a grain of sand in this he says he sees no such monstrous sin i inquire if this is really a promise to me he repeats that it is a promise and resumes digging my contribution to the labour is that of directing the light constantly upon the hole when he has reached something more than a foot deep he digs more cautiously saying that be it much or little there it will not lie far below the surface such things never are deep a few minutes later the point of the pickaxe clicks upon a stony substance he draws the implement out as feelingly as if it had entered a man's body taking up the spade he shovels with care and a surface level as an altar is presently disclosed his eyes flash anew he pulls handfuls of grass and mops the surface clean finally rubbing it with his handkerchief grasping the lantern from my hand he holds it close to the ground when the rays reveal a complete mosaic a pavement of minute tesserae of many colours of intricate pattern a work of much art of much time and of much industry he exclaims in a shout that he knew it always that it is not a celtic stronghold exclusively but also a roman the former people have probably contributed little more than the original framework which the latter took and adapted till it became the present imposing structure i ask what if it is roman 
a great deal according to him that it proves all the world to be wrong in this great argument and himself alone to be right can i wait while he digs further i agree reluctantly but he does not notice my reluctance at an adjoining spot he begins flourishing the tools anew with the skill of a navvy this venerable scholar with letters after his name sometimes he falls on his knees burrowing with his hands in the manner of a hare and where his old-fashioned broadcloth touches the sides of the hole it gets plastered with the damp earth he continually murmurs to himself how important how very important this discovery is he draws out an object we wash it in the same primitive way by rubbing it with the wet grass and it proves to be a semi-transparent bottle of iridescent beauty the sight of which draws groans of luxurious sensibility from the digger further and further search brings out a piece of a weapon it is strange indeed that by merely peeling off a wrapper of modern accumulations we have lowered ourselves into an ancient world finally a skeleton is uncovered fairly perfect he lays it out on the grass bone to its bone my friend says the man must have fallen fighting here as this is no place of burial he turns again to the trench scrapes feels till from a corner he draws out a heavy lump a small image four or five inches high we clean it as before it is a statuette apparently of gold or more probably of bronze gilt a figure of mercury obviously its head being surmounted with a petasus or winged hat the usual accessory of that deity further inspection reveals the workmanship to be of good finish and detail and preserved by the limey earth to be as fresh in every line as on the day it left the hands of its artificer we seem to be standing in the roman forum and not on a hill in wessex intent upon this truly valuable relic of the old empire of which even this remote spot was a component part we do not notice what is going on in the present world till reminded of it by the sudden renewal of the storm looking up i perceive that the wide extinguisher of cloud has again settled down upon the fortress town as if resting upon the edge of the inner rampart and shutting out the moon i turn my back to the tempest still directing the light across the hole my companion digs on unconcernedly he is living two thousand years ago and despises things of the moment as dreams but at last he is fairly beaten and standing up beside me looks round on what he has done the rays of the lantern pass over the trench to the tall skeleton stretched upon the grass on the other side the beating rain has washed the bones clean and smooth and the forehead cheekbones and two and thirty teeth of the skull glisten in the candle shine as they lie this storm like the first is of the nature of a squall and it ends as abruptly as the other we dig no further my friend says that it is enough he has proved his point he turns to replace the bones in the trench and covers them but they fall to pieces under his touch the air has disintegrated them and he can only sweep in the fragments the next act of his plan is more than difficult but is carried out the treasures are inhumed again in their respective holes they are not ours each deposition seems to cost him a twinge and at one moment i fancied i saw him slip his hand into his coat pocket we must rebury them all say i oh yes he answers with integrity i was w wiping my hand the beauties of the tessellated floor of the governor's house are once again consigned to darkness the trench is filled up the sod laid smoothly down he wipes the perspiration from his forehead with the same handkerchief he had used to mop the skeleton and the tesserae clean and we make for the eastern gate of the fortress dawn bursts upon us suddenly as we reach the opening it comes by the lifting and thinning of the clouds that way till we are bathed in a pink light the direction of his homeward journey is not the same as mine and we part under the outer slope 
walking along quickly to restore warmth i muse upon my eccentric friend and cannot help asking myself this question did he really replace the gilded image of the god mercurius with the rest of the treasures he seemed to do so and yet i could not testify to the fact probably however he was as good as his word it was thus i spoke to myself and so the adventure ended but one thing remains to be told and that is concerned with seven years after among the effects of my friend at that time just deceased was found carefully preserved a gilt statuette representing mercury labelled debased roman no record was attached to explain how it came into his possession the figure was bequeathed to the casterbridge museum detroit post march eighteen eighty five end of story six